Welcome to Myron Details. I'm Nick. And I'm James. And this is the Industrial Design Podcast by us. It, that's it. It's, it's one of them. <laughs> we, we need to have a, a tagline competition. Oh, we do. Send us your taglines, guys. DM, DM, DM to us. <laughs> Slide into those DMs. Slide in. With, uh, with those, uh, those captions. That's right. Um, and uh, yeah, how you doing, James? It's been a while. I'm good. I'm I'm uh, just coming back off of vacation mode. I saw that you were in the pool. Oh, in the pool doing Instagram stories. Mm. It was lovely. I was uh, so my my wife recently got a new job, which gave us some some vacay time. Well, congrats to her. It was yeah. It's uh, it's a great new position for her, and uh, so we went down to uh, visit her family. They live. She's originally from Florida. And uh, my in-laws were gracious enough to have us for about a week. Um, and yeah, it was great. I, you know, people, people like to say things about Florida. And I'm here to tell you, they're all wrong. It is wonderful. I'm, yeah, Florida's nice. My parents live there too. Let's get a little spot. Oh, yeah. Where do you? Well, I don't want to dox your parents. <laughs> they live, they live on golf side. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. But that's awesome. Yeah, it was great. Uh, and, uh, you know, I was delighted upon my return. Uh, I got some new sneakers. Oh boy. Okay. Yeah. What'd you get James? <clears throat> well, you know, as you know, we're both, we're both interested in sneaker culture, but not, not experts. Right. We're not hype beasts, but we're, yeah. we're wannabe hype beasts. Yeah. We, uh, we like to Did hang. you get, hi- did you get a hype shoe? I mean, uh, I don't know if they're hype anymore. I okay. think the hype might be over. Um, but I got some Adidas boosts. Okay. I don't, uh, I think those are cool. Yeah. Well, you know, from our podcast with Seth Fowler, he was saying that, um, Kanye, like before he came out with his Adidas Yeezys, right. he was seen at that one concert. There's the, the famous oh. photo of him jumping in the air so wearing you got those ones. boosts. You got those Yeah. Ones? So I'm like Man. six years, you know, still, I think I'm still in the hype zone. Yeah. Six year, <laughs> six year old fashion trend i think that so yeah they had all it you know it all cycles i actually i realized this too i got a new pair of shoes this week too what yeah i mean just the same ones new black vans nice because you know i only have one pair so i wear them out like every two months so uh-huh just gotta buy new ones <laughs> <laughs> i'll Perfect. tell you what i'll tell you what those those boys they're crispy mm. Mm. there's nothing like a Is good that, pair. has that been the nick baker signature for for how many years? What vans? The vans, the black vans. Black vans have been a recent trend. I've been, uh, well, this is kind of another tangent. Last night, well, here, here's an update for you, James. Uh oh. We design <laughs> news. <laughs> We've I redone my whole bedroom. I I know I. <laughs> and if you aren't watching the YouTube video, check it out because you can see we added lights. I bought some lights, and that's all I really did, and it moved my desk. But it feels like a lot. It feels it feels less like a bedroom, which uh, you know I don't know how you feel about that, but <laughs> I feel great because it feels more like a professional, right. uh, you know, uh, collaboration. And and for yourself, I mean, what what are you doing with this new setup? Well, um, you know, I dove dove down this rabbit hole of what would happen if I wanted to do some sort of YouTube video thing, Patreon thing. Um, I actually put a Insta story out just to get some feedback on that. And I think we've talked about before of how we can like, I can somehow create this extra, extra section that everyone wants. You know, everyone wants the tutorials. Everyone wants the, right. the videos and things. I've been trying to figure out a good way to do it. Um, and yeah, I mean, I think it's been well received. Um, I was like, looking at some of the comments a lot of people seem seem happy and they would mm-hmm. be interested in paying for content oh wow um, awesome so that's that's kind of the route i'm going and you know one thing is clear like the instagram will always stay the same there will always be late night nick there will always yeah. be the instagram live stream there will always be my posts the chair sketches everything like that cool but for those people that want that extra level that extra mile um i am happy to give it to them and in return for some support, I mean, Sweet. I, hopefully we can build up some sort of really fun community content or something. Yeah. I haven't really figured out the entire the entire thing yet, but I'm working on it. Would you say that this was uh, inspired by our, you know, last week we were talking about uh, Mirren, Myron, uh, 
you know, Jacob Dawson, he recently right. put out a video about our podcast talking about him. Yeah, it's it's an Inception video. Yeah. But, um, uh, yeah, last week we had a, had a talk about design school. We uh, follow this guy on YouTube who quit design school. And so he we talked about him last week on the podcast. And then he made a video of us talking about him. Yeah. But this whole Patreon, putting up your tutorials, you know, was that... Was was that the final push? Seeing seeing what Jacob was doing, or was it a culmination of things? I think it's a culmination of things. It's one of those. Here's an interesting thing. Um, so right now I have a studio and a bedroom. So mm-hmm. I have my workspace and then my place where I live. And right now my workspace is not fully enclosed. It's private. I have my own office, um, but the the walls don't go to the ceiling, mm-hmm. so it's not closed off sound wise. Right. So I've been like figuring out like how. Should I go about this? You know, that's why we do the podcast in my bedroom. And I was like, you know what? Enough of this. Like, let's just make my bedroom like the podcast space, the video space. <laughs> so I have it fully uh, soundproofed. I have, I just bought like, I don't know, 20 pounds of, of, of rubber. So I apologize. I know my room smells like vulcanized rubber right now, <laughs> but <laughs> I brought like 20 pounds of rubber. To, like, you act like that's sound- a bad thing. There are people that would pay good money for the smell. Listen, I'm immune to it. You know, I've been working in the pet industry for three years. Right. You know, you work with dog toys long enough, you just turn into yeah. a piece of volcanic rubber. You've, and before that, you were actually paid to throw rubber into volcanoes. Yeah, exactly. You know, uh-huh. I, I, we all a, have heard the story, Nick. A high school job, right? Exactly. <laughs> um, but yeah, I, I'm excited to start doing that. And I was just researching last night. I kind of dove down this rabbit hole of like minimalism videos. Mm. I don't know if you've ever researched minimalism. But but there's a guy that was talking about how he just buys the same exact shirt and the same pants. And he just buys like, you know, 10 pairs. Yeah. And so he can just wear the same thing every single day. So you, that's what I'm trying to do with my Vans. I'll bring it back to the yeah. Vans. You would think that there would only be a few videos about minimalism, you know? <laughs> James. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. But uh, uh, yeah, that's kind of what I've been up to this week. I'm trying to think if there's anything. Oh, I um, I met up with another guy. I met up with a guy this week. His name is Michael Pryor, and he is an architect. Pryor slash... to what? <laughs> that's his last name, Pryor. Michael Pryor. Okay. P R Y O R. And you can check out on Instagram. Um, he runs or he helps run the Design Morphine Instagram at Design Morphine. Cool. We'll link to it, and then he also has his own Instagram. Uh, it's like michael Pryor, but backwards like e i mike i'm not sure we'll link to it um but the interesting about him the interesting thing about him is that he creates algorithms that go into design software so he creates mm. algorithms that go into grasshopper uh and rhino oh wow so he doesn't like well he does do design like his profession is architecture but he actually goes home and like in his free time he like codes the tools to design, which yeah. is a whole nother level of design. Oh, God, I wish that was the, my hobby. You're like the designer who designs design. Like what, you know, that's crazy. If that, I mean, you know, it's like, if only that were my hobby, my hobby right now is creating toy vehicles that <laughs> nobody can buy. <laughs> well, one day, one day, maybe. maybe. Oh, how's that? How's that car race going on? Oh, I, I'm not sure. I haven't received any updates. Um, but uh, I don't know, uh, you know, well, still still well, waiting. Yeah, still well, still waiting to hear back from both parties. Cool, cool. Um, but yeah, but stay tuned. And there's also another animation coming. Okay, secret. Secret. Stay tuned. So stay tuned. Um, well, yeah, I think that was that was good. Uh, yeah, you have some design news, James. Yeah, I was uh, I was checking out you know Fastco Design as you do, um, and they have, design news. Beep, 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 beep. <laughs> they have this article about this material, which I guess they covered before, called graphene, mm-hmm. and uh, and the first graphene jacket was just made. Okay, it's now, like a it's like a raincoat. Or yeah. is it like a winter jacket? It's I think it's a it's like a, a shell in between kind of. Yeah. Thing. Okay. Um, but you were I, I brought it up and you were then educating me on the material. Yeah, yeah, graphene. Uh, so I I don't know how much you know about graphene, James, but I was kind of mentioning that graphene is it's it's a recent discovery. I think mm-hmm. it's it's the only material that has a Nobel Prize. 
Don't wow. quote me on that, but I'm, but I'm pretty sure. Um, it was discovered when someone took a pencil, like just a normal HP pencil, rubbed it. I don't know what they rubbed it on. Maybe maybe like I think it was a CD hmm. for, for whatever reason. And then they took a piece of, a piece of scotch tape, put it on top of the the graphite, and then pulled it off. And what you get when you do that is you get one single layer of graphite or carbon. Oh. Graphite is just carbon. So you get one layer of carbon atoms. Yeah. And the bond between all those carbon atoms is insanely strong. Like it yeah. can hold like an elephant or something like that. You know, they, they give those like weird like yeah. scenarios. Like if there was an elephant on a plane and it jumped out and then it could land on a, you know, it's like what? So, so you're saying a, a pencil, a CD and some scotch tape. This yeah, sounds like can, a discovery. We can, right we can make it right now. This sounds like a discovery that was done in the back of a history class <laughs> in like the 90s. Like right, right. Some, some stoner like just like drawing on, I don't know, a Dave hey, Matthews band CD. Hey, dude, check this out. <laughs> Holds up an elephant with it. Um, that's but, crazy. But yeah, I mean, it has so many insane properties to it. I think one of the properties was like uh insulation mm-hmm. they can hold in heat really well so i think that's why they made a jacket out of it um now the the jacket isn't like a piece of scotch tape <laughs> let's put that out there <laughs> it's not a piece of scotch tape no. it is it's graphene like flakes infused into nylon uh with some sort of rubber or uh, resin compound so it's some sort of comp- compound right um, but it's still an interesting jacket. Yeah. Well, the the interesting thing to me is it it linked to this other article about using graphene for hair dye, for you know dyeing your hair. Like oh, interesting. Uh, and and apparently all gonna, it does is it like sticks to the hair follicles. Are you gonna dye your hair black? Yes. I'm going full goth. Sweet. Nineties. You know all all the all the fashion. You can borrow my black vans if you need them. Thank you. Um, I would also appreciate it if somebody would send me some eyeliner, um, but um, and a box set of the Cure. But what it does is apparently it the the material just adheres or or latches onto the hair follicles, so it's not actually like chemically changing the hair. Okay. It's do, just a, do, do normal dyes chemically change the hair? I. I I think they do something like that. We are not qualified. I we're not qualified, but but apparently this they're they're just sort of celebrating how non toxic it is for hair and oh that's awesome. Uh, uh, but yeah, it says it can change the color of your hair and can also turn your home into a giant the walls of your home into a giant fire detector. Oh, I read that too. So that too. by the transitive property, it also turns your hair into a fire detector <laughs> or it changes does your article, walls into hair. Does that no? The article does not say that, James. <laughs> I'm sorry, Nick. I just got back from vacation. I'm in I'm in goofball mode. Um, but um. But yeah, the jacket was it was it's a little pricey. It's like seven hundred bucks. They, or they said something crazy like if you let it out in the sun, like have it out in the sun, it will absorb the heat, and then you turn it inside out, and then it will insulate the heat. Right. So you know that's I mean. The material science is yeah. It, essentially, graphene does whatever you want it to do. <laughs> oh yeah, and also it's kind of like it's kind of like silly putty. It carries an electrical current, right? And I, <laughs> but they were saying you could hack it to like charge a phone in your pocket. Yeah. What this? There's, it's all. It's, it, yeah. They I haven't mean, figured everything out yet. They're just at like at this point. They're just, fantasizing, but yeah, throwing darts at a wall. Um, but yeah. <laughs> That's oh, cool. Oh, one more thing. I know that graphene is actually making leaps and bounds in the battery world. Mm. I think there's a lot of uh, a lot of opportunity for batteries to be improved with graphene, right. which is really exciting because that's the one thing that's really been holding us back in technology right, right. now. Right. You know, we we had this. Uh, what's the what's the curve called with like the processing power doubling every two years? Oh, I have no idea. Yeah, oh, shoot, I forget the name. But you, there was, you know technology is exponentially improving faster right. and faster and now right. it's started to like maybe not exponentially but more of a gradual linear increase right and that's because we just can't get our batteries batteries to hold enough power yeah uh, but yeah. graphene should help that and you know my boy elon he's on it oh yeah yeah boy uh, when are we, when is he coming on the podcast uh we got him scheduled next week so hopefully he shows Good. his schedule's a little busy yeah i can imagine um but uh but yeah so 
I mean, from there, we're going to do a really awkward transition into the topic because most of the time we have really good transitions. But now we are crowdsourcing design. <laughs> We'd like to crowdsource a transition from you guys. So send it in, minor details podcast at gmail.com. Um, no, we, we wanted to talk about we want to talk about crowdsource design. How did how, I? I forget why we were, this got brought up. Well, I th- there's a few things that I've been thinking about with yeah. crowdsourcing. I think the one thing that just spurred spurred the uh, topic was uh, the space force, right? Where the oh yes, the, the space force logos. Yeah, the Trump administration wanted to crowdsource, and I think President Trump wanted to crowdsource the um, Air Force One paint, yeah. paint job on the Airbus. Yeah. Um, so yeah, we. We were kind of looking at some of those crowdsource logos and, you know, it's, a, a tear was running down our cheek. Well, it, the funny thing is, is, is all of these, all of these competitions just end up being a meme competition. <laughs> it, it's like, it, it never, it's it never fails. It's, it's like those competitions that they had in England to name that boat. Oh, and they named, they named it, it? Bodie McBoatface. Yes. That was the number one. Because everyone was trolling. Yeah. I, I love that. Yeah. I mean, you cannot trust the internet to do something seriously just like you can't expect me to to uh to be serious during this episode of the minor details podcast <laughs> this is why we do it though <laughs> design's not a serious thing yeah Come on, we do li- it, lighten up we do this for the memes hopefully somebody's going to start cutting up our youtube videos and making memes out of it that'd yeah. be sweet yeah that that'll mean that'll mean that we that we've made it that'll meme that, that will meme made. that we made it i mean we've got the trolls I mean, I, well, we have the Instagram trolls. Mm-hmm. All we need now are the memes. We need some meme makers. Yeah. Send us memes, guys. Yeah, and make them real meme, you know? <laughs> I can't handle this. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. But, um... I So, yeah, crowd, crowdsourcing design. Crowdsourcing design. We want to chat about it because it's it's something that... I don't think it's like a super... It's not like a super popular thing in industrial design, although there is some companies that have tried to do it. Uh, mainly quirky right and you interned there i don't know if you have any thoughts on that like how that was about well and for those who aren't aware of quirky can you give like what is quirky well before before i go to quirky i would also like to point out that i think i talked about this on one of the prior podcasts but i did in when i was in school i did an lg phone design competition and that was essentially a crowdsourced competition for for amateurs to submit ideas um, and we, as, as a bunch of second years in industrial design, uh, me and three other guys, we won this competition. We won some money. I don't know what they ended up doing with the designs. I saw elements of them in some of their phones. Yeah. Um, but, uh, but that was a crowdsource. That was actually on Crowdspring. Okay. And it's actually kind of funny that you say that because crowdsource design is also very similar to competition design. Right. In a way. Right. Yeah. I mean, this... Uh, I, I mean, what really is the difference? I mean, some competitions, some competitions are more just for like the prestige, the awards. Yeah. yeah. But there are actually like competitions where the, there's a prompt and it's like, Hey, design the next vacuum. Cleaner. Yeah. But does, but does when money becomes involved, does it then become crowdsourcing? Yeah, I would say yes. Because because yeah. a lot of times what crowdsourcing is is taking taking an idea that's submitted and then bringing that to market. Yeah, I I would lump that in with that. Or just owning the IP for the idea. I think yeah, I think there's a little bit of difference, but I think for this general conversation, I think yeah. it's pretty much the same. Yeah. So I mean, after that, a couple years later, first internship out of school was with Quirky, and essentially what Quirky did was they built their own sort of social network and you could pay money to submit an idea. And I think you could, you could only submit like one idea a day. Okay. And I forget how much the entry was. And it's actually now like relaunched under new ownership. Wait, quirky. I thought quirky died. No quirky went bankrupt and then got bought out a rebirth. Yeah. Rebirth the Phoenix. Um, but none of the same people as far as I know. Okay. Um, but, uh, but it was, it was a really interesting idea because you would get submissions. So what would happen is these submissions would come in, you know, uh, through this network. Okay. And then we would all divide up into groups and they were all categorized. I mean, this was about, uh, I think four years into, or three years into Quirky's, uh, you know, run. 
And so they had some things a, a bit tweaked from when they're, where they started. So they started categorizing when I was there. Okay. And so there, you know, there was like lifestyle, electronics, all, all, the, all right. those sort of categories. People would submit ideas and then we would sift through the ideas and essentially just evaluate them within internal teams. So you were evaluating ideas and as, as an intern? Yeah. Ooh, oh, that's yeah. Cool. Okay. Um, that was one of the cool things about Quirky is that even as an intern, you had as much of a voice as anybody else. I mean, it, it could be easily squashed. Right, right. Um, but, um, but yeah, so uh, then once those ideas were filtered, they were, we then had this weekly eval- evaluation live, live streamed on the internet. And it was like a game show. That's you know? interesting, huh? And so we would go through like 10 ideas or something and we would pick which ones would, we would then take into development. And there were there were essentially panelists, um, and they were mainly people who were leaders of different departments up at the front talking about the ideas and and the feasibility or you know what they saw or what they didn't see in the idea. Right. right. And then there were you could be in the audience, you could grab a mic, and you could say something about the idea. Or huh. I, I at one point argued for an idea yeah for an it was it was like this did it get done did it get made no it didn't but it was it was this idea of like uh, a travel kit for a loofah that would like squeegee out your loofah so you could yeah we we don't need that oh (laughs) you don't need that because you're filthy nick you're disgusting (laughs) i need that because i love my loofah um but um but yeah so i like i I forget there was a term for it, but I but I essentially like lobbied for the idea right, live. Right. Um, but uh, yeah, it was it was a lot of fun. I mean, you know, we were getting all these ideas. Obviously, it's very overwhelming the amount of ideas that were coming in right. when I was there. And, and I, were, I, I assume that a lot of them are like r- really bad. Uh, I feel like when you just open things up to the internet, right. you just get a lot of trash. Right. But you said you had to pay, actually. Yeah. There's had, a paywall. You had you had to pay okay, to so that, submit. So you, then you get another level, I think. Yeah. But it was crazy. There were some people that would submit almost daily, and it was like they had taught themselves 3D modeling. Like, they, their profession was not in the design industry, but they right. had taught themselves. They're just some accountant that's like... Yeah found this thing on on the website yeah they 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 were submitting 3d like renderings like wow. not you know not best of the best rendering but something that you could understand right and um one of those people i remember one of their ideas going through and like they had maybe submitted 20 ideas while i was there okay. and one of them got through and it's like you know, if that gets if that gets to market, if it's successful, you get royalties on that. Right. And the other thing, interesting thing that Quirky did was it, like there were phases to the project, and so, um, like, anybody who was an influencer in any of those stages. So if somebody suggested, uh, like some sort of alteration, or you know anything to the product, and we went forward with that with that idea, they would then become an influencer. So they would even get a cut of the final. Whoa. Yeah. That's interesting. So, I mean, quirky, so like if you added on to the idea, you got a little cut too. Yeah. That's kind of nice. That's a good incentive for the employees. Yeah. I mean, quirky was a really amazing idea. I really wish, i sorry. I, I'm thinking about that. I really wish that would have happened at other companies too. Like, I know I've contributed so much. Right. Like well, utility, well, nobody in, utility to some of my designs, like right. utility patents. Oh my yeah. Design. And like, that, that's like, I would love to like, just give me 1% of that. That's you why know? you got to get that Amazon associates going. <laughs> <laughs> but, but the thing is, none of the designers got any percentage. Oh, it, this, just I'm the... just talking about people within the community oh. that would get that percentage. Well, they should, they should put the community. I know. Whatever. But, but, uh, well, so, so here's, here's the thing that I eventually sort of, during my internship at Quirky, you know, I started to realize there's this fine line between uh, like innovation and novelty. Yeah. And, you know, I would say that like I kind of I enjoyed Quirky for for the ideas because they were quirky. Like the name of the company is Quirky. Right. I'm expecting 
like funky more novelty yeah, for sure. but i think that a lot of times what they were really interested in going after was innovation yeah and that was sort of like the the overarching message right was was about innovation and they just i mean you know they were they had a lot of aspirations as a startup and and honestly like i don't really have too much bad to say about quirky i mean like for the most part it was a wonderful experience for me personally right. like as an intern like i got i got a lot of responsibility and and the shop like they had a full shop they had they had everything at your disposal wow it's like a, a dream and id studio right yeah hmm. so um but crowd the whole crowdsourcing thing it's just especially when it gets to such a large scale it's difficult to filter those ideas and like a lot of times you would see an idea and say, there's a really good spark of an idea there. Mm, right, right, But right. the problem was is that we couldn't go forward with anything unless we were like this, they're submitting sort of like the final-ish design or like, like we can't just take inspiration from what they did. Ooh, and that's a, that's a kind of a tricky like handcuff scenario. Yeah. You know, it's like, ooh, wait, it's like if you see the idea and then you're like, oh, this idea would be good, but what if I did this instead? It'd be even right. better. And then you're saying that that would get shot down. You can't do that. No, you can't, you mm. couldn't you it, couldn't really mess with it too much. Here's here's my my experience with crowdsource design. I don't know if you know this, James. I actually started out doing graphic design. Um, that was like my intro into design. When I got to college, I, I don't know. We, I think we you about talked this? about this. Well, when I got to college, my roommate was a graphic designer, and you know he was like, "Hey, Nick." check out this website called 99 designs and we've i think right. we mentioned it right and 99 designs is a crowdsource sourcing platform for graphic design mm -hmm. which is a def definitely a completely different thing compared to industrial design because you know you're not looking at royalties you're just looking at like literally a client pays this website 300 bucks and the website says okay and then they put the design brief up and they say hey here's your client their their name is a uh, uh, tech tech radar they're a new tech company that does uh, tech security or some yeah. like generic thing like, and then you just get like a bunch of people like submitting logos right which was kind of it was it was good practice like that's where i found so much really helpful was like i went home that fall quarter in my entire winter break i just like did these logos I only won two competitions, or I only won two crowdsourcing. Only, yeah. That's, I mean, that's a lot more than a lot of people win in terms of like crowdsource yeah. design. It's it is very hard too. Like, the the problem is that, especially in that um, nine nine designs layout, you got to see other designers' right. submissions. So you would see and their ratings. So the client oh. would rate them. So like the client would rate, you know, one submission five stars. And then all the other designers would see that rating oh, and then just like no. copy it and then tweak it. It was a disaster. Oh, no. Uh, but yeah. And then also you would submit a really great design, what you thought was great design. Um, but the final design would just be like the trendy design. And at the time, at the time, it usually was like something with like a bunch of gradients and strokes and like something really elaborate. Right. Whereas a great design logo is pretty simple and iconic, can yeah. be used on a lot of applications. Yeah. So that's like my, my intro into I don't know, competition design. I don't, I don't know if I've done a ton in industrial design. Right. Um, I mean, obviously there are like things I've submitted designs to, in terms of like licensing and uh, things like that, or I've done like exhibitions. Um, I haven't done a lot of like like competitions like the idea awards or the red dot i haven't done a lot of that yeah um and then one thing i was kind of thinking about is it's kind of along the same lines but maybe maybe a tangent is like are you ever in a meeting where your boss is like hey let's all vote on the best design like you have a bunch of concepts oh, on the wall no and then they're like they all like get the they get the post-it notes out or like yeah. the, the markers out and like okay go go mark your favorite one yeah and so everyone gets up and like the marketing team gets up and like the lawyers get up and like right why, why, why are the lawyers in this meeting <laughs> <laughs> i don't know has that ever happened to you because it's kind of along the same lines of like letting in in a sense competition design in my head is like taking away the design from the designers right right it's like not letting the designers do the job like the, the job of the designer 
is to be the guy who knows what looks good and right. what functions good. And right. then when you take that power away from them and said, oh, no, no, I'm not going to let you choose that. I get to choose. Yeah. Then there's like this weird scenario there. Right, right. I think, um, oh gosh, I lost my train of thought. Well, yeah, I mean, have you ever had a meeting where people... Oh, vote? yeah, yeah, yeah. I, well, I haven't personally had that meeting. I I can't think of a time when I had that meeting, but it's, I've it's definitely... Happened to me. It's happened to me. It's definitely happened where I've been a part of a design by committee. Yeah, it's and, similar, similar. And very that's, similar. that's kind of like universally understood in the industrial design like industry to be a a term of remorse mm-hmm. you know and, and for those who aren't familiar with design co- by committee essentially what happens is when everyone gets in a room like marketing engineering all the teams get in a room and everyone goes around and says their concerns oh i don't think this design's gonna be a good market it may not fit on the shelf at PetSmart. sorry i'm just like <laughs> <laughs> ranting about my one scenario okay uh and then the engineer's like oh but it doesn't it can't be manufactured and so everyone goes around the room says their concerns right and then my boss was like all right nick go figure out all those things and then you end up with some sort of like frankenstein of a product well yeah, so so let me uh, let me go on maybe a little bit of a tirade here. Yeah, let's hear it, James. But get get that uh, get that. And anger and this may out. be <laughs> totally unfounded, but no marketing or engineering people are hopefully listening to this podcast. <laughs> what are you hired for if not to solve the problem of marketing and engineering? You know, <laughs> it's like we like you think that it was just easy breezy for us to come up with this concept, and it's like. You're hired to essentially solve these problems, not not blockade designs from going through, right? Yeah. I mean, that's 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 something that I think is actually qu- quite lacking in design education. Is like, I think there should be more intermingling with engineers and marketing mm. and business in school. I think that'd be amazing. I wish that group projects were like that. Like, yeah. I wish you had an engineer on your team and a marketing person. Yeah. Like that'd be so much better than having four designers on a team. Then right. The, the problem with that is like everyone wants to design, like no one wants to do that. Right. Other stuff, so. Well, yeah, but the, the thing is I actually, I did a, a, a semester long class that was, was a mingling. I think of you mentioned the this, three. Yes. And it was a great opportunity for, for sort of understanding the concerns of the other people and also having, I don't know, just having a better, I've, of an idea and more sympathy of like what their concerns are right around the idea. Um, and just like a better appreciation for what each person brings to the table. Cause I think that appreciation has to start before the professional world, because oftentimes I felt that in, in certain companies, like when a company gets too big, it always becomes like, a uh, a combative relationship. Right. It's like, and it's always like there's one head of the department who's like who's like the gatekeeper. Yeah. And they are trying to block anybody from the outside from like infecting their Right. You know. Like marketing versus engineer, yeah. designer. Yeah, it's always like clashing. And I, I agree. I think I kinda remember vaguely like going into my first job thinking like, oh man, design's like amazing and I really want to like this is, this is like really important and I really want to push it. Right. And, you know, hearing the pushback, like, Hey Nick, you can't do this. You can't do that. Whatever. It was a little bit, I don't know. It was a learning experience. Like, yeah, I can't do these things. Um, but let's talk about it. Like, let's kind of work out why I can't do these things. What is the reasoning? And eventually, you know, you either come to a place where like, oh, maybe I, maybe we can compromise. Or right. maybe it's like, I just need to understand and respect that the fact that this thing can't be manufactured right. the way I want. It it just can't because yeah. of the pricing or whatever. And there is there is some give and take from that relationship for but, sure. Yeah. But, but it I, definitely takes some time to learn. Right. And I always think it's good. I always think it's good to give just even a bit of pushback like you don't as a designer you don't want to just roll over for any other department right like you want to make your case right you know and a good engineer like i've met a lot of really great engineers who will work with you and through the problems with you and you'll you'll oftentimes end up at better solutions 
than what you started out with. Yeah. Because it's a cooperative relationship. Yeah. It's, you know, it's I mean, not that, that's, combative. That's really good. I mean, if you have a good engineer, like, that's a great relationship right there. If you can yeah. meld with them. I I don't, I feel like I haven't had that opportunity. <laughs> My, oh, really? I mean, I don't want to, like, talk bad about my no. engineer, but... I have to I have to believe that there's engineers out there having this conversation about us. the opposite. <laughs> I hope so. I hope yeah. so. And they're like, oh man, you know, there was that one designer that everything had a uniform wall thickness <laughs> and you know, they put the bosses in the right place. You know, it was just did, like Did I ever tell you about the time I didn't do uniform wall thickness? <laughs> that's a well, apparently you lived to tell the tale. I that's a that might be a story for another podcast. Mm. We can get into the nitty gritty of that sometime, yeah. but I think the the other side of this whole crowdsourcing thing is, I see a lot of designers now on Instagram experimenting with, and I, and I myself, we talked about this. Um, with it was like either last week or two weeks polls? ago with polls. Oh man, and that's a whole other beast. I mean, I gotta I gotta say, like I love polls. It's like the number one feature that has changed my life. <laughs> it's so powerful. Yeah, to get the thought. I mean. You know, especially when you build up a large community, it's like, I can pull 50,000 people. Right. Like, that's crazy. It's very powerful, but you also have to know when to be the king. Oh, you yeah. Know? I mean, I always have already decided the poll. <laughs> you guys are never voting on my decision. <laughs> I've already decided. It's yeah. long gone. Yeah. I just do it for fun. <laughs> but I mean, the, the poll that I did, the polls that I did for my Muji pen hanger, I actually think we're, we're pretty productive. And, and there's a lot of things I started to think more about the design and how I'm going to like tweak it right. and maybe explore some other options. But, you know, it was, uh, I wouldn't say that it was, it was bad. And I think it's, it's also a way, you know, in which if you don't have somebody around to get feedback from, it's a nice way to like reach out to a community. But the problem is, you know, and the same thing is for crowdsourcing is, Everybody has, I mean, this is the great problem of social media. Everybody has the same level of voice yeah. as anybody else. Right. And that's not necessarily bad in terms of like gauging a market. But when you're trying to get direct feedback, like who knows where the feedback is coming from? Yeah. I, I mean, mean, like it could just be like people that are, are saying yes to this one thing are probably not even qualified to even use the product itself. You know, it's like. <laughs> right. Or would never use the product to begin with. Right. And why should I care about their feedback? Yeah. And so does it does it mean I know that at one point Quirky was talking about wanting to, you know, access experts in fields, mm. you know, to try and even further filter, um, you know, because you could you could essentially send out an engineering problem to a group of engineers and crowdsource that solution. That's interesting. I feel like that is a much better solution than general crowdsourcing mm -hmm. i don't know like I, do you feel like crowdsource design is has value at all or is there is it just completely like well i'm i'm currently and i think i've expressed this before but operating off of this new theory and, and i'm testing it out which is the comedian theory what's the what's the comedian theory which is um you know it's it's basically like if you are if you're trying to um, come up with uh, an interesting new solution. Um, first, it's internal, and you develop it on your own, and then you gauge gauge the reaction. Okay, so like comedians, like they go to yeah. the, the, the club at night and test their new jokes. Exactly. So it's, so it's just constantly testing, and whether that's through polls or likes or whatever, I think that in the age of new media, you can so quickly get responses to your ideas. I mean, Kickstarter is this essentially you right. know, to a large degree. Yes. And it's like, I've worked on this. How do you feel about it? Instead, I... of, instead of investing all this money in the front end and then putting it on shelves and nothing, right. nothing happening. I think that is 100% right. I think that is how crowdsourcing should be. Like you, like the Kickstarter crowdsourcing way, like, utilizing your design to to you know create something you believe in and then testing it against the market with crowdsourcing methods you know, whether mm -hmm. that's polls whether that's kickstarter whatever it is yeah i think that is the benefit of crowdsourcing not necessarily taking ideas from the crowd but just testing the the idea with the crowd right 
I think that is a much better way that we can utilize crowdsourcing. I agree. Hmm. And with that, I think we should move on to some questions. All right. Um, Thanks for sending us in questions this week, guys. We had some great questions. If you have a question for yourself, it's myourdetailspodcast at gmail. Um, Our first question comes from Adam Sawyer, and he says, Do you think doing a fourth year and getting a degree is really needed? Slash, how much does it help to get your first job? And, you know, Adam is in school. He's going into his fourth year, I assume. Um, But, yeah, it's kind of a interesting question i'd I'd be curious in the the details of this adam but you know if you're a junior thinking about not doing a fourth year and just going straight to the job market that's kind of a unique thought i don't know that many people that have that thought Mm -hmm. but maybe there is i don't know what do you think james we were well we were kind of talking about this in the previous episode you said you knew friends that left school and went to go work right yes i i did um but i don't think they I don't think they were feeling like junior year, like they're done. I think it was like they got an internship junior year, then they got another internship, and then they realized, hey, I need to get a full-time job. Right. Like it was kind of like they were good enough to not even have to do the fourth year. Right. Well, the question is, what does the fourth year provide? You know? Yeah. What I mean, for me, I think, I honestly think that your senior project is usually not your best project. That, that's my personal opinion, and that's kind of what I've seen uh, a lot of my uh, colleagues do is like your senior project is this thing that's kind of, you know, your thesis or whatever. It's this thing that you've been thinking about for a while. Yeah. Presumably. Like it's something that like you've been having in the back of your mind like, oh, man, I really wish I could do this. And you do it and, you know, either you do it really well or you or you kind of like slack off because mm. it's your senior mm-hmm. senior class and you don't really do it. Or you do it really well and you don't really document it because it's your senior year. And you right. Because it's not even like you're applying to jobs in January. Right. And you're not finished with your project yet. So right. I, I don't know. Was your thesis a full year or a half year? It was one quarter, which was even less than half. One year. quarter? Mm-hmm. Yeah, we had quarters at SCAD. Oh. Yeah, we had three quarters. Oh. Three quarters? <laughs> yeah, we, yeah, because in the fourth quarter of summer. Interesting. It was a very different setup. Huh. I liked it. We had three classes each quarter. Yeah. Um, which gave us a lot of leverage in terms of like, we could easily, because usually the, the three classes were, you had two classes that were related to your field, and then your third class was like a filler, like a history or a, mm. a English or something. Okay. Um, Interesting. Yeah, I um I mean, I do remember coming back for my fourth year of ID and feeling like I'm I'm just ready for some experience because at that point I really hadn't gotten any experience. Right. And um that year usually there was a sponsored studio by a company which would have made it very much worth it, right. but that year there wasn't. Hmm. And so you know, that was the first semester was supposed to be the sponsored project. And that I think might have changed my mind about fourth year. And then my, when it came to my thesis project, I really took the attitude of this is my last chance to do something really weird. Yeah. Uh, and uh, however, I've continued to do weird things. Um, I, I agree. My personal time. I, I like that that fourth year is that chance to do what you want. Yeah. Because when you're in college, you have all the time. Right. You have all your time dedicated to what you want to do. Yeah. Like when when you get a job, like you don't have that time anymore. You got to, you got to work eight hours a day and then you can go home and do what you want. Right. But think about having all that time back. (laughs) And I think honestly, that's like, that is the beauty of design school that, that maybe we touched on a bit in the last episode, but that ability to experiment mm-hmm. with no repercussions. Yeah, you can make the craziest thing and no one will care. No. Hopefully hopefully somebody will care. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I guess that... that but, uh, but yeah, I mean, I don't know that it's necessary to go to do a fourth year. I mean, if you feel ready and and you feel like you don't, like, I mean, there's... Do you want the diploma or or not? Because as we said in the last podcast, diplomas don't really matter in the long run in the design field. Yeah. Nobody asks to see your diploma 
uh, like during your job interview. Here's what I would do. I, I mean, I don't know how many people you know, Adam, but I would take your portfolio. I would send it out to everyone that you know that's already working in the field and then ask them if your portfolio is good enough to get a junior level position. Right. Because that's the real question, I think. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I would not just say, you know, no fourth year if you have zero job prospects. <laughs> right. I, I think the scenario of not doing your fourth year is that you are so good that you're already picked up. Right. I'm pretty sure that is how all the scenarios have gone. Yeah. Or you are done. I don't know. There's other scenarios, but yeah. Yeah. But yeah, thanks for sending in, Adam. That was that was a good little interesting niche question. Mm-hmm. Uh, now we got a question, and I'm going to uh, have this person remain anonymous because I I feel that Ooh. they would want this. Okay, anonymous question. Um, and this is this is sort of a similar, well, in the kind of in the same boat as the last question, but this is about transferring schools. Okay. So this this particular person feels like the college that they're going to is is not um is not providing them with the kind of resources they need and also not and because of that they are unable to get placed at a job that they would desire to be placed at you know they feel like they're coming in behind other people who have maybe gone to what they consider better schools interesting and they think that their professors you know, don't necessarily fit the bill. Like they, they don't have a great amount of experience. They don't have maybe good connections. Um, and so they said that they're, they're going from their internship year between their second and third year. Um, but it basically, because of their, what they say is a poor choice in the school that they went to and the quality of teaching, they haven't secured their dream placement and have to, and have had to have settled for a subpar one. Well, wait a second. You're saying they they didn't secure the dream job, an internship? Yes. But they had to settle for a subpar internship? But they had but they have an internship, which is a good step. Right. Any internship like guys, I worked for the Boy Scouts. <laughs> and let me tell you, I sat in a cubicle for 8 hours a day, and some days I didn't say a word to anyone. I never even saw people. <laughs> it was like office space. It was like jail. <laughs> I'm surprised you know what Office Space is. Yeah, that's one of my favorite movies. It's one, uh, of my, one of my really? two, two movies I watched. Yeah, oh, Mike Judge. Mike Judge, Be- creator of Beavis and Butthead. I don't, and I, I don't know. Absolute yeah. genius. You lost me. Um, but, uh, but, but they are saying they're considering changing their school for their final year. Their final year. But they're worried it'll affect their grades. Um, but it, will it be better for their development? Oh. Ooh, that's an interesting question. Because I think th- there, there's, there's two sides of it. I think there's one side that is like, oh, you know, my school's bad. Like, I can't do that. Like, blah, blah, complaining, right? Mm-hmm. Like, I think, generally speaking, I think as long as you have access to the internet in, like, eh, some sort of design community to build off of, like, right. you know, you can motivate yourself to do these personal projects and test yourself, you know, if... If your school's not pushing you, like push yourself against your peers on Instagram right. or on you know, right. the internet. Like there are resources for that. But then the other part of the question is, should they switch to a different school and would they get any benefit from that? Mm-hmm. And I think there's there's maybe a little bit of benefit just because I, I imagine that they've already kind of built up some sort of network there. If they've been there two years, mm-hmm. if they switch for another two or one year to another school, they might make some more new connections. Yeah. Mainly I'm thinking networking. Right. I don't know. Well, I guess at the end of the day, you know, you're spending money. You're, you're spending money on an education. And if you're not satisfied with the education, then maybe it's time to switch. Yeah. I mean, but, it's your money and I like you right. gotta make sure it's worth it. But there's another part of this email that I think is a little bit I don't wanna say delusional. Okay. But you know, and I'm not saying specifically about this person because I don't really know their work. Right. Um but that they haven't secured their dream placement. 
Mm. In that that was the one part. Yeah, that was the one part that was a little weird. To yeah, me too. in their internship going from second to third year, I would say level your expectations. Right. Yeah. You you can't. I mean, I mean, amazing if you could yeah. get a dream placement, but odds are ninety nine percent of you guys aren't gonna get the dream job. Uh uh-uh. uh. Especially as an intern. Yeah, I think. I think there's this virus that's going around. What's the virus, James? And the virus is is that people think that they deserve more than they than they've gotten. Right. Or, I, I had that virus. Yeah. I mean, no. I I would say that. I think we all do. When I was in school, extent. I had high aspirations, and I think that there's good things. There's good things that come with high aspirations because I think if that if I didn't have them, I probably wouldn't be here now. Like, I, w- I probably wouldn't be where I am in my career. Yeah, I mean, when you have high aspirations, it certainly motivates you to, yeah. some, to some extent. But I don't think anybody should look down their nose at any job opportunity. Yeah. Like, if this is the job that you qualified for, Amen. then this is the job that you deserve. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. No, no, I, I 100% agree. I think there's so many times when people, like, see a job posting and they're like, ah, oh, I don't, you know... I don't have a job yet, but I don't think I want this one. So yeah. they just skip it. Guys, apply to everything. The market right. is so competitive. You guys aren't going to get a job if you're just like waiting yeah. for your dream job. And I wouldn't, you know, I, I can't speak for you, but I can't say that like my first gig out of school, I mean, you know, uh, like my first full-time gig was not necessarily like my dream job. Right. But oh, I, I, mean, I was designing litter boxes, James. You think that's my dream? <laughs> I but I got a lot out of it and made some really great connections, met some very talented designers. 100%. You will be shocked to find some really amazing talent in places that you never expected. It's crazy. I've so, you know, I worked at the pet company Petmate. Yeah. And I've realized that just cuz I work there, I've met so many other designers that have connections. They're like, oh yeah, I worked for that brand like yeah. five years ago. I'm like, no way, I just did the newest dog toy line. Yeah. They're like, yeah, I did that dog toy line back in you know 2005. I'm yeah, like, that's crazy. Yeah, you know? and just and, and the other thing is like we we often look at these like design firms and and these places that look really cool, but you know you know like it could it could be that you go there and you're like I, well i don't like this either like i you know this this is not what i expected exactly and i i honestly think that going to a place where i wasn't it wasn't necessarily my dream job leveled my expectations to a point where i'm very appreciative of every opportunity that i have mm-hmm. going forward to to make money doing design i mean yeah. that's amazing yeah we get to make money doing what we love yeah. isn't that the goal in life yeah although i would love to talk about that topic sometime of the do what you love meme uh because i think it's uh, a little bit bs okay <laughs> <laughs> but uh but yeah i just i feel like you know i think that if you're at a school where you feel like it's not necessarily that great and you have the you have the option to move you know maybe it's the right move but, you know, are you surrounded by inspiring designers? Like, are there other kids in your class that are doing really good work? That's a good point, too. If, yeah, if you are, there's always the, the old tale of, like, always, if you are the best one in the class or, like, the best one in the school, mm-hmm. that means you're in the wrong place. Yeah. You need to be at the bottom of the totem Right. And, and, well, and the other thing is they say that they're not so impressed with the teaching, but... Could it could it be that they're not really open open to to the lessons that are being taught? That's true too. I, I don't know. I think that I, I it's a tough decision to make, and it's a very personal decision to for make. For sure, yeah, we can't say for sure, but um, but I but I think that there's there's a level of appreciation and expectations that have to be mixed into this. Yeah, yeah. I, I thank you for sending that in. I mean, that was a very good, very tough question, and you know, certainly follow up with us and, you know, we'll, we'll support you in your decision. Yeah, um, absolutely. And then of course, every week we like to give a shout out to, uh, an Instagrammer or slash designer or some, someone who we think is doing interesting work. And this week I wanted to shout out this guy named Tachyum. Yeah. I, I don't know his, I don't know how to pronounce his name. His Instagram handle is at 
T A E K Y E O M. Takeum. Um, I showed this to James. James hasn't seen it, or he, I just showed him to them the other day. But this guy, he's uh, just an assistant professor. I forget what school, but we'll link to him. And he just fiddles around with 3D printers all day long. Mm. And so he's done, his most recent thing is like taking a 3D printer and attaching a pen to the head of it so yeah. that it can print not plastic, but it just draws with a pen. That's awesome. And he just does a lot of like really interesting like spirograph. Huh. You guys remember, you remember spirographs? Oh yeah. Do you ever oh. have spirographs? God, that was such, that was like, it was like tripping on acid without <laughs> taking drugs, you know? I had a spirograph pen that it was like a pen with a spirograph set on the end of it. What? Yeah, when I was a kid. Oh my god. It was it was one I actually collected Living pen. that high life. I actually collect <laughs> <laughs> When I was a kid, I actually collected pens that had like extra elements to it. Nice. Like I had like a silly appendages? Pen. Yeah, I guess. Appendages. A uh, pen? James. Yeah. Exactly like your Muji pen. Right? Oh. I had one pen that was like a etch a sketch on the end, a silly putty pen. Uh what else did I have? Oh that would have been hard to hold. I had a race car pen. It was a remote controlled car that stuck on top of a pen what? to like charge. It was interesting. Anyways, that was my How did my... it charge? Kinetic energy? No, no, I mean it had a battery in it. <laughs> Feverish writing? Oh, I also had a spin art pen. You know spin, spin art? art? Yeah, you know you know when you had the little like thing? And then uh, the the motor, it was like a oh, pot- pottery wheel. Right, it was a pottery wheel. Okay, this right. Is a long tangent, but a pottery wheel, and you put a piece of paper on the pottery wheel, and then you put paint on the pottery wheel. Yeah, and, yeah, okay, sure. But yeah, check out Techium. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Um, he does also interesting clay prints. He prints mm-hmm. with clay as well. Wow. Uh, doing interesting designs there. Um, but yeah, thanks for tuning in, guys. Yeah. Uh, our. Uh, Intro and outro is by Kiyoshi the Kid. Oof. Check him out. So good. Um, I hope he likes how I chopped up the intro for the uh, micro details and major details. Yeah, we got, we're got we on YouTube now, James. Yeah. James yeah. has been working on YouTube hard. It's amazing. Like and subscribe. Like, uh, like and then, and yeah, pay attention. You know, I, I've been releasing micro details, which are clips from the podcast, and then the major details after the pod right. episodes. So if you guys want that quick and easy content check mm-hmm. out the youtube because yeah. james has been setting it up and it's it's looking good it's on point and of course if you want the classic stuff we're on apple Podcasts, google play never spotify all right <laughs> r.i.p i wish come on come on spotify well i'm working on my connections we'll get in there somehow yeah um but yeah thanks for tuning in guys yeah absolutely um, yeah do we do we mention uh i mean Mention your Instagram, yeah, Nick. I, I'm at Nick P. Baker. And I'm at I Draw and Receipts. All right. Sounds good. Peace out, guys. Later. <laughs>